No, two two more minutes until it's six. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Gentle, you are live on the <clears throat> on the internet. We can start. Good. So, Drex, do you want to do a voice check real quick before we get started? Yeah, yeah. I'm good. I think we 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 are good for voice. My stream has good voice. You sound good. Okay, so everybody's got the voice check ready. Everybody can hear us. Okay, that's good. I think we're ready. Okay. So good morning, or whichever time zone you're in today. And welcome to this session of Virtual Abilities 2020 Mental Health Unconference. I posted the URL of the unconference schedule. You can read about it there. We're going to be posting next week's sessions there soon. So please bookmark that web page and return to it after the weekend updates. Our next session that we will hold will be on Monday at 11 a.m. SLT. The title of today's session is Mental Illness in Literature. And there's the screen information again. I'm Gentle Heron. I'm president of Virtual Ability Inc. And that is the physical world nonprofit that supports the virtual ability cross disability peer support community in virtual worlds. And sitting with me today is Draxter Dupre. He's a well known Second Life personality, the creator of the Drax Files video documentaries, and now he leads the weekly Second Life book club. And we're going to begin with a disclaimer. Neither Drex nor I are literature professionals. Mm -hmm. Our credentials during this session are that we both are avid readers. I'm a former special education teacher, though, and I am certified and I have taught junior high school language arts. And Drex, you have some experience with special needs individuals, too. Can you please tell us a little bit about that? <clears throat> yeah, and thank you, uh, Gentle, for inviting me to, uh, to this to this forum, to this discussion, it's I'm really thrilled. I'm really thrilled to be here, and uh, this this topic is 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 a, is a wonderful topic. Uh, my mother was a special ed teacher, and I grew up with kids with intellectual disabilities and um, uh, forms of uh, physical disabilities, and I grew up around them, observing my mother when she was teaching. Uh, I tell this story very often that later in life as an adult, um, when I and my friends would encounter someone with a disability, uh, they would act weirdly and I was uh, I felt uh, much more comfortable with them. And I realized that a lot of people in, in um, the public have issues or don't know how to relate or don't know how, <clears throat> you know, what the protocol is to relate to people who are differently um, abled. Then as a civil servant in Germany, where it was required either military service or civil service, they changed that now, but I did my civil service in a social psychiatric institution where people who were in closed uh, psychiatric institutions were basically uh, being um, trained to work again in a quote unquote normal uh, outside uh, job situation. So we had uh, job trainings and, and, and um, group therapy sessions, individual therapy. And this was a house where people would come in every day 
uh, they already live by themselves or in, in uh, supervised um, environments. And we also had about 100 people living in that institution. And I worked there for uh, a year and a half. So the, I, as a young man, as a, uh, how old was I? 19. And it was, it was a real, <clears throat> it was a real eye opener in many ways. Thank you, Drex. Our topic today is really huge and it could be a semester long university course. Oh yeah. But we're doing an hour. <laughs> um, so I made a note card for you all of a bunch of books that I'm recommending that you might want to read them. And if you click on the bookcase up here, you will get that note card. And you'll notice that I included some classic literature as well as some more modern works. A lot of young adult YA books are on that list because authors are starting to write more for that reading level about mental illness. Mm -hmm. And this is really good because many mental illnesses begin in adolescence. So there you click that bookcase and you get that note card and it'll be in a folder in your inventory named Unconference Literature Note Cards. That folder will also contain a note card listing the five books that Drax is going to tell us about and a couple more and some links to obtain them from Goodreads. And Drax, before we start discussing the books that you selected, please tell us why Goodreads is a good place to purchase reading materials. Well, I think, I mean, I stumbled across Goodreads um, a while ago and I just use it to keep track of my own reading and have a kind of a virtual library and remind myself what, what I'm interested in and what I want to read. So it's like a virtual to, uh, to read stack basically. And they have links to all the major online retailers, uh, as well as some lo local outlets like IndieBound, which is a project where they uh, link you up with local stores in the U.S. Um, we all know that Amazon is very problematic in, in many ways uh, with, you know, the price gouging and, and stuff like that. So I didn't want to link this to, to Amazon, although Goodreads also links to Amazon. Uh, I want to give a shout out to bookshop.org. If you're in the U.S., bookshop.org is uh, a project where they give away 75% of their profit to local stores and highlight local events. And they position themselves as the anti-Amazon. Bookshop.org is not linked to Goodreads. But again, Goodreads is a great place to maybe start a profile and and keep track of your own reading and, uh, you know, just search for stuff and then put it into the want to read, want to read uh, folder. My want to read folder is almost as big as my Second Life Friends list, possibly bigger. So maybe they should, <laughs> they shut me down. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Okay, that's more than enough introductory material. So let's get down to discussing the books. Um, the first book, Drax, that I want you to tell us about is titled I'm Not Stiller. Mm -hmm. And it's originally in German. Without giving anything away, can you tell us a little plot summary for those of us who haven't read it? So I'm Not Stiller is, is an amazing examination of sort of, um, I don't know, a, a, a really, really severe a uh, personality disorder i would say of someone who cannot accept himself as as the being who he is uh he cannot accept himself uh for for what he did i mean he didn't do very bad things i'm not going to go into detail but the book opens uh with the person who is narrating the story saying i'm not stiller everybody keeps telling me well you're stiller it's in your passport we have this evidence uh, so this person, which which is at the center of the story, is totally denying who he is. And then the book uh, proceeds to uh, detail wh why that is and wh what are the uh, the psychological underpinnings of this of this self denial. And it's it's extremely powerful. It was written by a Swiss German uh, novelist uh, post war in in Germany. We we do pre-war and then post-war. I mean, very rough distinction here, of course, because during the war, there was really no uh, culture in Germany, as we know. And Max Frisch is is very well known for sort of deconstructing people in their into their psychological components. That book had a huge impact on me because this is someone who is basically, I don't know if, if the diagnosis would, would be... Um, you know, a, a form of 
schizophrenia because he he's just uh, categorically denying the re the reality of of who he is. So he f wants to force a different reality upon himself mainly about about a different um, person. And it's funny now that I have lived in in America for so long, and I I really admire uh, the American sort of in theory the you can reinvent yourself you know you can you can move on and so that 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 sort of freedom i mean at least in theory is is very different from the german experience where you are always going to be defined uh much more so than i would say in the us i mean it has changed as well over the decades but uh this is a this is a very very i think european book that americans will enjoy and let me say one more thing i remember me, uh, meeting a friend when we read this in school we read this in high school i think in 11th grade there was a friend who graduated before me and she was already working and i hadn't seen her for a couple of years and then i met her and, and she says like you know how are you doing and i said well i'm doing good you know so what are you what are you interested in what are you doing and i said well i'm you know me i'm a book nerd i'm reading and she says what are you reading right now and so i'm reading max frisch i'm not stiller and I enjoy it. I think it's great. I think it's really kind of about me. And she literally, and I remember this to this day, she looked at me and said, maybe you should see a, a you should, you should see someone, it, you know, <laughs> a sort of tug in cheek, but also a little serious because the, 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 the character here in the book has, has problems, has very, very severe problems, but it resonated with me as a young man, uh, you know, struggling with defining defining who you are okay and i have not read this book but it sounds like it's about not just identity but also self-acceptance self exactly how, yeah how do you see that as relating to our conference theme of mental health and mental illness well what's very interesting for me uh, uh, like i said i worked in civil service uh in a so social psychiatric institution you know like a total rookie coming in there and and all these people some of them very jaded and then some psychologists just like you know she's crazy just give her more medication blah 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 and i remember what fascinated me was the discussion about uh, especially schizophrenia and how to how to treat it and there was was a lot of discussion about this like people you know people were saying well there is a therapeutic approach uh, this might be childhood trauma we can sort of th therapy this thing out of people and other people said no it's a chemical thing uh it's it's like today i mean it's this push and pull between uh what is what is this what is the connection between the the, the chemical issue and the nature versus nurture essentially and recently i heard a radio uh story here in germany about what has changed in, in the psychiatric field, and there is a lot of very innovative uh, approaches to schizophrenia when people hear, for example, voices. So uh, there is now apparently an approach where, where people, where the therapist will incorporate that voice and not try to uh, suppress it, but but incorporate it into the discussion and, and, and have a fundamentally different approach, which means accepting those voices um, in some context. So um, I, fi I find that uh, fascinating when you talk about acceptance, which this book is about. So, you know, the, I mean, I, like, like you said in the, in the outset, I'm not an expert. I'm observing this from the outside, but I'm very uh, hopeful about these different approaches because when I worked there, the approach was very rigid. It was you got to get rid of these voices with whatever medication is available and with with, with whatever tools so yeah thank you um the next book you said you wanted to talk about is one actually i hope i never have to read and it's called the kindly ones can yeah. you briefly tell me what this book is about and did you have the same reaction you read that book did mm -hmm. you have the same reaction i did when i just heard about its description <laughs> no this is really weird i mean this book is is i if if i were to go on an island uh i would take this book i would not take david foster Wallace's infinite jest which i also love i would take the kindly ones the kindly ones is i think the german version is is about 1200 pages this is an american author who lives in france 
This is a story about World War II, and the character at the center of the story is a gay uh, man who is in the closet, and he is an incredibly interesting character because he stumbles into a career with the Nazis, and he just basically fails upwards. He is not a career Nazi. He's not an ideologue. Um, he just happens to be, well, you know, quote unquote, at the right place at the right time to, to, to come into these Nazi circles as the fascists uh, arise in Germany. And then he makes a career out of it. And uh, all the while, he's, of course, suppressing um, his homosexuality. So, th so this is an incredibly interesting character. And I cannot, you know, tell you what, <laughs> how I would diagnose this, this, this person. Uh, or, or w w what the problem is here, but the book is brutal. The book will describe the brutality of war in incredible detail over 20, 30, 40 pages. Okay, I mean, absolute violence, and then it will juxtapose this with uh, an evening event with the Nazi elite where they serve champagne and they play violin and they wax poetically about Mozart. This book is so important. This to me is one of the most important books about uh, war, I would say, about the madness of war and about the incredible sociopathy of uh, people who can be in this environment and, and have absolutely no empathy. One more thing about this. There is a dream sequence in this book. Well, I call it dream sequence. Let's let's just say the the main protagonist goes to Italy where his parents are during during the war and they're in safety. They're fairly well off. They live in a villa. And then the main protagonist uh, wakes up and he sees his parents murdered in blood lying on the floor. And he leaves. And it's unclear if he murdered them. Uh, and and so, yeah, I don't I don't know how to how to how to wrap this up. The kindly ones, if you can stomach this this material, this is an incredible uh, achievement. There, it's it's um, situated in real historic events. And again, the character at the center of this, the fact that he is a uh, a homosexual person in the closet at the time and his his it's not a it's not nihilism i don't know what it is but 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 it's it's a brilliant way to um see the events unfold through the eyes of this of this guy yeah well drex you use the word sociopath i would have used the word evil do you think evil is a mental illness and why or why not oh man you know, I, I'm not a medical doctor. I just play one in Second Life. Did you notice, Gentle, that my name is not Draxter, but it's actually Dr. Axter? So perhaps I have some credentials. Who knows? <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, the, the, the question is, does evil exist? Uh, oh, man, this is this is so difficult. I, I don't know. Sometimes you would look at people or his, historical people, you would look at people around you that right now. I mean, you look at some people uh, in high office, um, you know, in, in, in any number of, of, of countries today, and you would say these people are are evil. I can only say that in this book, and I was actually looking up his name, the protagonist, the fictional protagonist is called Maximilian Aue. Um, he, I don't know if he's evil. I think he is incapable of any empathy for anyone. And now the question becomes, uh, I mean, this is commonly referred to as as a sociopath, right? The question is, is this treatable? I mean, we're talking here about mental health. I mean, let's let's just throw this on the table. How do we actually? How would we deal with someone like this? You know, would would he have to be incarcerated? Is this something that you can apply therapy to? I I don't know. So there really is still a lot of questions. The kindly ones does not offer. Uh, when we talk about the kindly ones, is it doesn't offer any prescriptions or any <laughs> good feelings. Um, at the end, 
it it's it's even uh you know some people have uh, criticized the book as being um very very cynical uh i would just call it uh realistic because uh the protagonist survives uh at the very end i'm you know i don't think i'm going to spoil it because you're either going to read it for the for the content or not this is not something where there's a puzzle to be solved at the end but but he um uh he 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 survives he survives uh, the the war uh, as he sort of he stumbles from one thing into the next and he's just sort of untouchable and i think it's brilliant that this character is at the center of the story and not a a person that we can dismiss easily as an evil person although this person is a mass murderer <laughs> sorry <laughs> okay well let's lighten this up a little bit the third book we chose to discuss is one that i know a lot of us in the u.s read during our high school literature classes it's steinbeck's of mice and men and for people who've not read it or who don't remember it if high school was too far ago could you please tell us a little bit about the plot of of mice and men now, of mice and men is uh, I gotta say, John Steinbeck. A couple of things. My son was born in Salinas, and we lived in Pacific Grove. People know this. This is an area, the the Salinas Valley, the salad bowl of the of the country in the U.S. Um, this is where John Steinbeck uh, lived and where he worked, and this is his topic. His topic is uh, it's one of my favorite writers, a very very moral writer, uh, writing about the plight of working people. Um, of Mice and Men is, is essentially about two, I guess, farm hands or, or, or traveling uh, workers that go from farm to farm. Um, today, these folks are uh, primarily immigrants. The, the uh, protagonists at the helm of, at the center of Mice and Men are, are American. And it's, um, and I forgot, I forgot the main guy's name i only remember lenny's name i gotta look this up real quick george. george yeah so george's brother lenny is is uh mentally disabled or intellectually handicapped please uh correct me what the what the correct term would be um but he's good natured and uh they um basically come to a farm and it's it's a it's a it's hard it's a hard it's hard life it's a hard uh, life and hard work that they do. They go from farm to farm. And then there is a little bit um, of a uh, silver lining at the horizon where they get the offer to possibly buy their own land and, and, and settle down. And then uh, something very tragic happens where a woman uh, from the farm is flirting with Lenny and Lenny is uh, doesn't know his own strength. And he basically well accidentally kills kills that woman because the the they're, they're flirting and there's there's a little bit uh physical stuff going on and then the woman uh screams because lenny does not know his strength and then he then uh he kills her and george and lenny have to flee and i don't know if i should give away the ending because i don't know if people read it it's uh no don't give away the ending hmm Second. no don't give away Okay, I'm not going to give away the ending, but let me just say it's interesting that gently you said let's move from the kindly ones to something lighter. I don't think it's I don't think my said men is is lighter. It's actually in many ways compressed uh you know uh, it's equal it's equally sad because I don't know, to me John Steinbeck uh I always read John Steinbeck in the context of a fa of failure of of a society that should care for the for their weakest and in that sense john steinbeck is always incredibly relevant and i think this is the same at the core this is what this uh topic is about as well there you know there is no way that george can um you know let's say put lenny into a, a place where they can take care of him or have uh, people of his condition for example it's just not available at that at, at, for his class you know, or for any class that matter for at, at that time, I mean hardly. So, that's that's what yeah. this book is 
about for me. That's a good good summary. People with intellectual disabilities, such as Lenny in this book, and they are, I think, called learning difficulties in British education. Mm -hmm. And they were called retarded back in Steinbeck's day. And we don't use that word anymore. But they're not generally thought to have mental illness. Where do you see the mental illness in this book? Well, I don't. <laughs> and... Uh... I don't know. I just I put it on the table. I mean, there's a difference uh, be, be, between the two, but it's often uh, conflated. So I think maybe um, that's a good question. I think I felt when you when you asked me uh, for this um, for this discussion, I felt we need to talk about this book because to this day, I think in the general public, there's a huge problem in identifying and classifying and and differentiating between mental illness and intellectual disability. It's, you know, I mean, I'm not telling the audience anything new that one of the big problems here is that we live in a very binary world where we want, or people want very quick answers and quick classifications and oftentimes confuse symptoms that look similar on the outside uh, as the same and then the treatment becomes the same. Um, reminds me, I told iSky this because I was in Edinburgh at a, a bed and breakfast and there's this old wonderful building next to the bed and breakfast and it had, it was, you know, built, I don't know, in the 1800s and it had this stone uh, inscription, home for the deaf and the dumb. Uh, and it was obviously, that's what it was, uh, I don't know how long ago, but uh, what was conflated here was people who were deaf and they were uh, thought to have an intellectual disability. So, yeah. Yes. And Jaden is pointing out that the word dumb in English also means mute. Ah, yeah. see, I didn't know that. Yes, but I mean, many people now don't realize that that had that meaning, and they do think that it was the other kind of dumb. Yes, well, that's that's changed. I mean, I think when we broaden this, uh, I talk about it in my book club all the time. It comes up all the time, and I, Shyla put this on the table first time around, and I become very aware, for example, that um, uh, dyslexia. You know, I mean, please, you know. Um, Move, move me along gently if I go off too much of a tangent, but I, I just wanted to say that another example of this uh, conflating or just, you know, not being nuanced enough is when we talk about reading, a lot of people my own age, they have had very uh, uh, negative experiences and negative emotions attached to reading in school because they were reprimanded as not being able to as being stupid because they couldn't read at the speed or at the at the depth because they had uh, or misdiagnosed or undiagnosed dyslexia. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, let's move on to another book. Um, was Billy, oh, whoops. Another book that um, many of us in the US probably have read is Slaughterhouse Five. Can you summarize Slaughterhouse Five? Before I do that, gentle, I'm actually gonna want to wanted to ask you, what do you think of Mice and Men? Is uh, of Mice and Men a book that that fits in this framework when we talk about mental health and literature? How would you oh, answer that question? I think it is important to realize that Lenny was probably not mentally ill, but I'm concerned about the husband of that woman mm -hmm. and the way he treated her. He was a, such a misogynist, you know calling her a tart, which is a very bad word in that time period, and calling her all kinds of things. She never even had, really had a name. He never used her name. It was terrible. And that may have been a mental illness. Is that just uh, not run-of-the-mill misogyny, or is misogyny a mental illness, or should it be classified as such? That's, that's a good question. It depends on, on the, yeah, Curly's wife. That's right, Smiles. Curly's wife, she never really had a name of her own. Mm-hmm. John Steinbeck is, uh, I just want to say this again, John Steinbeck is so, such an important, amazing writer. And if you're ever, when this is lifted, this uh, 
quarantine and if you're able to to travel um a friend of mine is running the Steinbeck House in Salinas. He is the head of the Steinbeck Association there. And I'm actually trying to convince him to build a replica of the Steinbeck House here in Second Life. I mean, that would be wonderful. Then we could actually have a book club in there, maybe. Oh, that would be lovely. So I'm going to back up a little bit and say that another book a lot of us in the US probably read maybe in high school is Slaughterhouse Five. Would you summarize that one for us, please? It's a little hard to summarize. Yeah, so uh, Slaughterhouse Five. I mean, there's there's a frame around it, um, but in at the in in the inside that frame is a character by the name of Billy Pilgrim, who is an optometrist. I think he's even an award-winning optometrist, but he's also unstuck in time, uh, and he is traveling in time. And he also is meeting uh, aliens that are called the Trafalmadors that put him into a um, kind of a dome where they uh, examine him uh, as a uh, uh, different species. Now, <laughs> uh, this sounds like some, some very uh, lighthearted, uh, fun read, which it is because it is Vonnegut. And Vonnegut is uh, an author that can pack really uh important and and dark subject matters into into something in into into a fun uh packaging actually i think uh that kurt vonnegut's son was diagnosed with schizophrenia i might i might be mistaken somebody can look this up but the book slaughterhouse five is in essence about ptsd and and billy pilgrim is very clearly suffering from ptsd he was in uh in Dresden, in Germany, during the um, firebombing of the um, Allied forces, he was an American prisoner of war, and he witnessed the complete destruction of Dresden uh, by the Allied forces. And uh, then he survived uh, the war. He survived some other things as well. And then, and and he was successful in his in his outer life. He never cried. He only cried alone in his room. Um, and so Vonnegut is, is, uh, man manages something that is really extraordinary. This is a fairly short book, actually, where he structurally, with the structure, it's a completely, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a chaotic structure, as chaotic as PTSD is, pro the symptoms probably are, um, where Billy is completely fine at a wedding and then he gets transported back to Dresden through uh, to the firebombing then he gets f f uh, he flies forward in time to the aliens to the Trafalgar doors and um, and so th so the 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 method of um, writing here is is tr is I guess attempting to um, to show how it feels in in, in some in in the person's head and it's um, it's absolutely incredible I just read this i finished this book two days ago three days ago with my son who read it uh, for english class in in german school so they have a um they can pick a book and i saw the list and said let's read this together and we read it together and we discussed it um and it really resonated with with him as well so yeah it's about yeah i i, I mean i i could go on and on about this because that the, there is so much detail and this and 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 Kurt Vonnegut's um style here with with Billy being sort of a, an optometrist and having this sort of uh you know quote unquote normal career and nobody notices what's going on with him uh but he's so matter of factly at one point he just discloses to his uh, adult daughter that you know what uh, time exists um parallel it's not linear and you know his family goes crazy go like you you are losing your mind and she he says very matter of factly no i'm not and there's other nuances there's of course it's an it's an anti-war book as well there's there's a lot of critique uh also um about um the actions of the allied forces and destroying dresden the way they did and harming the um civilian population there's a there's a tiny character in there who is a historian 
who knows absolutely everything but refuses to discuss Dresden because it looks bad. So that's just as an aside. But it's a, it's a really powerful book that in its structure uh, approximates um, how, it, how it would probably feel to have PTSD. Well, maybe it's PTSD, but some people think that Billy Pilgrim was actually suffering from brain damage. Ah. And I, I will comment that not all the effects of brain damage are considered mental illnesses. And the case in point is my own multiple sclerosis, which is brain damage and TBI, as Jaden pointed out. And Emmy pointed out in text also some of the biography of Vonnegut, and he claimed he himself claimed he had a genetic disposition to schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Twisty is saying it sounds like PTSD to him. You guys are very well informed, I must say. I wonder why I'm sitting here on the on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, but but see, this is so wonderful because we we can look at this from from all these different angles. Um, I find I read, uh, you know, when 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 you gave again when you told me let's do this let's do this panel, and I was just reading Slaughterhouse Five. I was primarily looking at Slaughterhouse Five before before you asked me this. I was looking at Slaughterhouse Five as a perfect um, anti-war novel that just shows you how how crazy the the the, the war experience is. I didn't even think about um, Billy's personal predicament here. I I really felt that the he was he was he was just sort of um, well, I'm going to diminish his role, but he, I mean, every character is a vehicle for something, but I felt in the beginning that, that structurally uh, the fatalism that is described in, in, in present that the Trafalmadors, these, this alien race, they basically say, you know what, time exists uh, parallel. So no matter what you do, there's nothing you can do about it. It's just going to happen. So, so that is, uh, before you talk to me, gentle, I thought that okay, this is the core. This is sort of a satiric uh, look at at a fatalist approach, um, and then, uh, gentle, you reminded me that maybe Billy Pilgrim is also a prototypical character uh, where we can examine mental illness. And you've been working with your son on this book. How old is he? He is 16 going on 17, and um, we have very, we have great discussions. There's another book that's not on the list. It's a German writer, Gottfried Keller, who is difficult to read because he is um, 19th century. Uh, the book uh, is called Romeo, uh, A Village Romeo and Juliet is the is the English title. This is a staple in German literature. It's an it's an important book, but it's a difficult book. And I read that with him too. And I saw it on his desk and he said, oh my God, I got to read this crap. This is incredible. <laughs> I can't even read one sentence. And I go, you know, let's let's look at this um, and let's bring it to the, to the present. And it is, when we read it, it resonated with him because the theme is a love between a boy and girl and their families hate each other, and they still um, go ahead with it, and they commit suicide, which is another interesting subject. I actually have another book that is not on the list, but uh, I digress. Maybe well, we should no, put uh, it because, on. Because the thing is, I wouldn't consider Slaughterhouse Five at all to be a young adult book. So, mm -hmm. what do you hope that your son will get out of reading Slaughterhouse Five? Uh, well, the I think the anti-war angle or the the angle that that war has only losers, which is uh, my which was where I'm coming from and where I'm, you know, ideologically convinced, is a peace nick or whatever. Uh, I think he's perfectly, uh, you know, I know that you're not saying that uh, he's not um, old enough or mature enough to to read it, but oftentimes the this distinction between young adult and adult literature literature is is a weird one to me i mean I, I love young adult books and i i love that there is uh, much more to choose from today than when when i was um a young adult 
uh, there's amazing uh, books out there uh, that that tackle really really tough subject matters for young people. But at the same time, um, why wouldn't Slaughterhouse Five not be a young adult book just because the person at the helm is an adult and has has his own family? Maybe that that will be the distinction. But the themes that there is a person who is in a situation in war where he is afraid for his life um, and then suffers uh, through either brain damage or uh, PTSD his entire life is a subject that, you know, you can open up the, the refugee crisis, for example, here in Europe um, and talking about uh, kids or adults that are coming here as refugees and traumatized through war you can open that up if i i'm just thinking about if i were the if i were the teacher that's how i would also draw the, the connection with this book but yeah it was on i was very happy that it was on the list from his teacher and i think sometimes we can interpret books differently as we mature and that's what twisty was saying that he didn't understand how come harry potter and some cartoons they're aimed at kids, but they speak to adults as well. That's oh, absolutely. I, I actually find it uh, quite. Uh, I mean, sometimes you find people you, people utter the opinion that uh, they don't read young adults. I mean, adults. You know, they say, like, "Why would I read young adult?" That's bullshit. Um, sorry to use the S word here, but um, <laughs> or the BS word. It's done well so far. Guys. Can I can I swear on this program? Are we on NPR? No, but. Uh, <laughs> It's a G-rated. <laughs> but it's a G rated, but oh yeah, it's a G rated tip. But the um, you know, I find that uh, I I I I love to read young adult. I mean, the quality. I mean, you know, Cory Doctorow was was guest here. He he wrote a bunch of young adult books that are absolutely amazing for adults. I mean, there's many many examples. I would actually encourage everyone. Uh, to to read young adults, even if they don't have children, you know, I mean, it's I think it's completely legitimate to read young adult to get into the minds. If you read a good young adult book uh, with current themes, then maybe that's a way into uh, to 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 speak to your teenager again. You know, I mean, I think that's actually a very legitimate reason why an adult would pick up a young adult book. Um, but there are many other reasons too. Uh, be, just be, you know, it's I mean, it's really good stuff. I'm actually translating a book called Rosehead, which is not on the list. Uh, maybe somebody could look this up, or I can put it into the chat. Uh, Ksenia Anske, Rosehead, is about an 11-year-old girl who, ha who has uh, possibly ADHD and is heavily medicated by her parents, and she discovers a strange conspiracy around rose bushes that may or may not be alive um so i just i'm just put this on the list this is a self-published author but she's very successful with her self-publishing um scheme and i offered to translate this into german uh for her for free um so yeah just another cool. one on the list cool Okay, well, we do have one more on the list, and that last one was is The Physicist. Ah. I, I will say I do want to read this book. That definitely is on my list now. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on in this book, please? So this is another one of the post-war, where we, where we call it here in Germany, we call it post-war uh, writers. Friedrich Dürrenmatt is uh, a Swiss-German writer, um, very, very important writer. Um, all his stuff is highly recommended. There's actually some graphic novels also by his, uh, from his other books. The Physicists um, is very, very strange as it is brilliant. There, the, it involves people, real uh, physicists who, uh, who voluntarily go into a mental institution okay, to, hi to hide themselves from the so-called real world. And... Uh, there's various reasons uh, for it. Um, they, they're afraid uh, that they're, um, that, that what they found out of uh, a specific formula might be stolen. Um, then there is a, a, um, 
a doctor in the mental institution who may also be uh you know uh mentally ill she imagines um people or uh specifically king salomo who is giving her orders and so it's a it's it's a, it's a play actually i'm i'm sure you can find um maybe an english version of a of a production on youtube it's it's incredible it's very short totally to the point in, incredible world building and 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 really um because these very normal brilliant physicists uh go into this mental institution it it's it's all i mean for me this is all about uh examining what is um crazy and what is normal you know i mean this question and that's the question that i asked myself when i worked at the social uh, psychiatric institution as a 19 year old when you come in there and you know you have like oh i'm gonna you know work with all these people and they're really crazy and then you realize wait a minute they are just like you yes they may uh feel extremely sad they may have had several suicide attempts or they may see little green men flying around um but they're but they're just like you and so um yeah this is this is uh this is a must read the physicists and I have to admit the character that would interest me the most is not the three physicists, although I am a science geek and they're interesting characters. But uh, as you mentioned, Fraulein Dr. Matilda von Zahud, um, this is, is a psychiatrist in charge of the sanatorium. You said you thought she had a mental illness. What kind of mental illness do you think she has? She's the one that's supposed to be normal. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I think she is, uh, to some extent, a sociopath. I mean, she is, uh, you know, she, her her planning, her her her. Um, uh, she, she I, I don't think she's capable of 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 having empathy, although she kind of pretends. And then she's also um, uh, controlled by this uh, by by King Solomon or King. Uh, König Salomo in, in German. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, again, she is supposed to be normal because she's in that position and she's a psychiatrist. I think what this story does, and again, actually, we haven't really talked about how fiction and poetry uh, can can get deeper to a certain truth about things than than anything else can. This is a this is a perfect example, where when you read it, you you will have to examine these conventions of normalcy, and especially that we um, we are conditioned as human beings to look at an institution and look at certain roles within this institution, namely Fräulein Mathilde von Zandt, Zandt uh, just because she is running this uh this 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 mental uh uh institution <laughs> uh, that she is why you know why do we why do we assume that she is normal you know we 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 buy into this um those roles uh, immediately and then Durnmat um just completely dismantles them yeah i i think she's a very malignant narcissist she certainly has delusions. She's a control freak. Um, I do think that this does help us to think about what normal means, and I think that's important. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, but also not only what normal means, but also uh, uh, we have to ask ourselves, why do we assume this, right? Just because she has a, uh, a certificate over her desk uh, where it says uh, Frau Director or whatever on her desk, um we we not only we not only assume that she has it together she we also assume that we need to uh abide by her authority uh, be, which 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 she has through her through her role there right we have to consider a lot of things i want to remind our audience to keep an eye on the evolving unconference schedule and there is the url for that our next session is going to be on Monday, May 18th. It'll be at 11 a.m. SLT. 
Dr. Nick Bowman, who is at Texas Tech University, is going to lead a discussion about our relationship with our avatars and how it has changed in the time of a pandemic. Mm. And now we are ready for questions and suggestions for other literature that we should read about mental illness from the audience. I want to ask if you would please type your questions, if at all possible, and if you would begin your question with the word question, as Moop has just modeled, we can find it more easily in the chat screen. I will uh, mention that John Laughing has said that he believes we're on the way to losing normal, that we, we may one day be considered as what we are without suggesting even a blameless failure to meet a standard. So here's your question, Drax, from hmm. Moop. Why have you chosen The Kindly Ones to be your one book if you are ever stuck on a desert island? You said ah. it does not have any prescription for any good feelings whatsoever. <laughs> so what is it about this book that will help you cope with the loneliness, despair, and deprivation on a desert island? Ah, okay. The uh, the amateur comedian in me has the answer that uh, on an, on a desert island, uh, I want to be reminded how absolutely awful uh, mankind is, and that makes me feel better to be alone. <laughs> no, but uh, I, I want to say, you, you know, this is a really good question, and. Um, uh, Daisy Gator, who some of you may know, uh, I had a discussion with her about One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Cuckoo's Nest which is an obvious book also, um, an important book. And I saw um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest as a, as a real life-affirming, wonderful book. I mean, there's a lot of tragedy in there, but I th this, is, this is a book that I can read and I can sleep really well afterwards. And Daisy said, no, it's awful. It's awful. <laughs> And I said, well, you know, I mean, there's awful things happening. It it lays bare the again uh, how these institutions are run and and um, uh, you know how 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 people are really treated. And I mean, this is the, if you don't know one flew over the cuckoo's nest, please pick it up now. Ken Kesey, I mean, this this was something of a revelation at the time that somebody would write so fr uh, uh, openly about uh, what's what's going on in the. Um, in the mental health care uh, business, so to speak. So, but for me, I felt I felt uh, I felt this was life affirming because the characters in there are are strong, um, and they don't, uh, you know, they're they're given the, str the they're given their strength back, and they fight back. So the kindly ones, while the kindly ones focuses on a extremely despicable core character who is this this nazi um ss uh careerist well he's not a careerist but like, like i said he he has no aspirations but then he's been he, he you know he gets promoted uh then he leads a concentration camp and it's it's terrible and then they go and listen to mozart after they murder thousands of people the vividness and the complexity it's not the book is extremely complex and i i cannot tell you i don't have a degree in uh english literature or any literature i wish i could dissect for you what the author did here where he infuses the mayhem also with a deep humanity so so to answer your question there's three quick things it is a vivid description of world building where the movie is in, in, in appears instantly in front of my my uh, mental um eye my imagination that's number one this is this is a sign of a very good book and i don't know how they do it the reason why i interview all these authors is like i kind of want to find out or you know by absorbing uh, how they do it um but also I come from a family that was, uh, you know, my grandparents, they fled um, the Russians coming from, from East. Uh, they fled to South Germany. And these stories are are all within my family. And I would argue that even my parents were traumatized to some extent. Uh, my mother passed away a long time ago, but uh, I grew up with uh, with sort of food insecurity in the sense that my grandparents grew up with incredible food insecurity and uh and lived in the in the bomb shelter and uh after the war they they had absolutely nothing to eat so all this stuff is just 
it's just in my family. So maybe I'm picking this book also because it it keeps me in touch with what I, by extension, feel is my family is my family history. But yeah, and I also uh, last I want to say that um, I understand why people could never touch this book or why people, uh, you know, cannot. I want to. I don't want to force this book on someone or, or or look down on someone who just can't stomach it. Um, I happen to be wired a way that I can ab absorb very very difficult art, and for some reason I want art to be challenging and difficult. If it's not challenging or difficult, it bores me. Yeah. Okay, I uh, posted the Goodreads link to One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And John Laughing asked, he says, he's sorry to ask a silly question, but Draxter, does that shirt come in Galaga? <laughs> no, this shirt uh, has not brought us into trouble, uh, uh, interestingly enough, because I wear this shirt in, in a lot of uh, films that I make for the official Second Life YouTube channel. Uh, their legal team has not uh, called me yet. This shirt was made by Loki Elliott from Escapades, where I live. Loki Elliott is a wonderful guy, but he makes only, um, he runs the kids community there, and he does not make adult size clothing anymore. This is a custom shirt that is not available. He also made my pants, by the way. So he, he has a full range of really, really cool kids clothing, um, and Escapades is sort of a, a sort of a whimsical role play community that Loki runs, I encourage you to check it out. It's in the destination guide. I made a video about it too. And we have a suggestion from Lala Jane. She's suggesting A Beautiful Mind. I don't know if you read that one. Mm. Uh, it's a very interesting book and I put the Goodreads link for that one. Mm -hmm. And John is explaining that Galaga is a video game. I know. And you would buy a similar shirt with that on it. You would buy it. Um, I'm going to talk to Loki about it. <laughs> okay. Um, Mook is making a book recommendation. She was profoundly affected by Scalagrid by William Horwood. It's a 1987 discourse on themes including disability, adaptive technology, and power. And she found that extremely eye-opening. Uh-huh. Thank you. And are and you adding this to the... Uh, note card maybe we should make a new note card combine everything and... we will put the transcript on our website ah okay the transcript with all of these suggestions will be on our website so we're encouraging people to give us book suggestions about mental illness doesn't have to be english books either you mentioned yes. uh i added one last minute and because you mentioned narcissism earlier uh, the book The Piano Teacher is another one that is very challenging, very difficult. It's about a very controlling mother uh, uh, and uh, the daughter, uh, the adult daughter is a gifted piano player and the mother is incredibly controlling and sort of pushing her to the limit um, if, to to make her into a, uh, uh, into a, a, a star performer. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough read. Um, it's an Austrian author, Elfriede Jelinek, the piano teacher. They also made a, a, a controversial film about it. Uh, this is actually the cue where I say that I don't like to watch uh, films made after books because they destroy the book for me. <laughs> they destroy the worlds I've built in my head. No matter how good the film is, it's, it, it's not a, it's not a, uh, it's not a comment on the quality of the film. The film can be very good. It can be made by a visionary filmmaker. But for me, this is very difficult, and I generally avoid it to watch a film of a book that I love. Except for in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, I guess. That's one exception. In my note card, one of the things, I, one of those categories I put were memoirs, so those are not fiction. And Mother Dearest kind of goes into that one. Um, mm -hmm. Twisty asked a question, which was also a suggestion. Um, has anyone read any Charles Bronson books? His mind is brilliant, but crazy. So you're saying the author may have mental illness, is that right, Twisty? Wait a minute, you're blowing my mind. Charles Bronson, the actor, wrote books? I didn't even know that. Wait a minute. That is crazy. Are we talking about the, cha the same Charles Bronson? Oops, did voice die? Hello? 
Gentle, your, vo your voice is off. Hello? Well, no, hey, we're trying to look up Charles Bronson. Um, hmm. Charles Bronson is a British prisoner who's been inside for decades. Oh, okay. I'm looking at. Oh, yeah. Here, solitary fitness, Bronson. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, here That's we go. Nice. Charles Bronson book of poems. English criminal and former bear bo uh, knuckle boxer. Bronson is often referred in the British press as the most violent prisoner in Britain. Bronson was a pretty was a pretty petty criminal before being sentenced to seven years, 1974. While in prison, he began making a name for himself as a loose cannon, often fighting convicts. And prison officers. He also embarked on one-man rooftop protests. He was released in 1988, but spent merely 69 days as a free man before he was arrested again. Ah, that is interesting. And his second marriage lasted four years. And he also renounced Islam. Insanity. I didn't even know that. Interesting. This is this is from Goodreads. Ah, this is this is interesting. It it sounds a little bit. I mean, that description to me here on Goodreads sounds a little bit like his agent wrote it. To be honest, <laughs> uh, to to make him sound, uh, you know, like uh, okay, uh, so I'm I'm looking for uh, a loose cannon who wrote a book about prison. Let's oh, uh, this is the man for me, but. Uh, I'm not. I'm not judging it. It looks. Well, maybe you just give it a read and see see what you think. Yeah. Thank you. This is. Uh, I'm. I'm always. Seriously, this. I want to say this. Thank you, and I am. Uh, out of control. Uh, in a. Uh, obsessive compulsive. Uh, this is my own issue. <laughs> Speaking about ill, mental illness, gentle. I I think I do have a form of OCD when it comes to books, uh, in the sense that I compulsively uh, purchase them and I do read them. But of course, I can't can't read them all. But uh, Umberto Eco actually said, maybe somebody can look up this quote, that there is no problem at all with being surrounded by books or living in a library, if you will, uh, where you haven't read everything. Uh, that is actually something that is very inspiring, and uh, and 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 that is uh, because sometimes we have visitors here, and I do have a lot of physical books, and sometimes the visitors go like, "Wow, did you read all of them?" And I go like, "No, I constantly read, but I haven't read all of them." And you know, we live in in a, a strange world where that that admission, if you will, uh, sometimes is seen as like, "Oh, you're just putting the bookshelf out to to seem like some sort of uh, intellectual or whatever." No, being surrounded by books uh, is just, to me, it's it's just a wonderful. That's it's a wonderful life. It, it's it's I can I can go there. I can randomly just pick something out, read a little bit, get inspired, and so I buy a lot of books and then I forget that I bought them. It, mm. happened, it happened more than once that I bought the same book three times. <laughs> But then I give it away. So what's the big deal? I can't. I struggle. I want to watch the Celestine Bros. What's that? Say that again, please. Huh? Uh, sorry. Sorry. Say that again. I I didn't hear the last thing you said. There's a there. There was a book that I attempted to read like ages ago called the uh, Celestine Prophecy. I only got through the first like first page and was like, nah, can't read this anymore. Just too like deep and stuff. Well, maybe you should try it again. See, this is the, also the beauty. If you have it, then you put it back in the shelf. You try it again. That kind of thing. Well, okay. sad thing is, I fell out. I kind of fell out with the person that gave it to me and oh. I didn't really want to keep the book so I ended up giving it to someone but I might try and watch the movie that's one of those things where you uh, divide up the record collection I see what you're saying um, gentle I have an onboarding with an author by the name of Paul McGauley you can look him up He's coming to the book club, and uh, I hope that he is in world already, so I do have to run out. Uh, 
the book club is happening every Wednesday on Book Club Island. Everybody's welcome. We're switching to 12 p.m. SLT <laughs> in June. How is that your highest Pokemon? General, I don't hear you, so I'm going to say thank you, guys. Yeah. And I do have to run out because uh, of, of, a, of a previous uh, engagement with Paul McAuley. I hope people enjoyed this talk. And feel free to befriend me. Feel free to come to the book club and uh, virtual ability. Thank you. And, and I hope you um, I hope the unconference is continuing. Okay, so take on. We can continue to collect recommendations from the audience. I'm sure people have other books they want to recommend and we can put them into the transcript. Let me hop over to Book Club Island if Paul is not showing up because there might be an issue with uh, understanding how time zones work. Wink, wink. Um, then I, I'll come back. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks, I'm, I'm going to disappear. And the stream uh, will be... I'll put this on the podcast too. We'll end the stream here as well. And and I'll come, okay. I'll come back. Thank you to the audience for coming. Thank you to Lori Vaughn and Electra for transcribing. Oh, this thank has you. Been a wonderful session. Thanks, Grax. Oh my God, did I speak too fast again? Oh my God, I need to put this on a big piece of paper in front of me. Gentle, thank <laughs> you so, thank you so much. Okay, I'll hop over to Book Club Island and and you I'll come back. Time. You did great. You hit your time limit on speaking. It was perfect. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna end the stream here. This was really wonderful. Um, I'll link the um.